Okay, uh, so everybody, good morning. Uh, it's 7.02. I think we go ahead and start. And uh, as time goes by, we're going to have more people jumping in. We also have the functional neurosurgery course here in the campus today. So there is a bit of a conflict, not to say that it's March break. <laughs> so, so today may be a bit different, but of course, uh, people will, will catch up and then we're going to have this uh, recorded as well in, in our social media. So uh, all will be able to follow this presentation either right now or later on. So who is going to go first today? Uh, I will go first, sir. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so Navarino, uh, go ahead. Perfect. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. No presenter mode, right? No, it's all good. Perfect. So welcome. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Juan Pablo Navarro. I'm a research fellow with Dr. Q. And today I have the honor to present this case of Dr. JP Almeida and Dr. Che Chana. First, I would like to acknowledge all the team involved in the care of this patient, Dr. Che Chana, Dr. Almeida, Dr. Goyal, Dr. Reuter, Dr. Alvarez, Dr. Edgar, Dr. Gentov, Dr. Vibute, and Dr. Jamie. Thank you all. Let's start with this 72-year-old uh, male that six months ago started with numbness in his left shoulder blade and upper extremity. Uh, for this reason, this patient went to see his primary care provider uh, who ordered a cardiac workup, which was completely normal. Uh, he went back home and two weeks ago, the patient presented or started with intermittent headaches episodes that were increasing in intensity. Uh, the patient decided to manage this with ibuprofen and the day before coming to us, uh, the, the, the intensity of the headaches were so severe that he went to look for attention at another hospital. At this uh, other center, they did an MRI where they could appreciate a posterior fossa mass uh, that it was very complex. Uh, and because of the complexity of the case, they decided to refer this patient here to us. At presentation here with us, the patient presented severe generalized headache, eight out of 10 with left-sided neck pain and left shoulder and an ominous numbness. And within the past medical history, there is nothing relevant but hypercholesterolemia history. And in the physical examination exam, you could see that the vital signs, the only measurement that it's altered is the blood pressure elevated with measures of 150 over 97. Out of that, it's completely normal. In the neurological exam, the patient was alert, awake, oriented uh, with normal speech. In the cranial nerve examination, uh, the only thing that we, can, we could notice at this moment was a tongue deviation to the right side of the patient. The rest of the physical examination was completely normal, and and now let me let me just stop right there. So go back to the previous line. Yes, sir. So educate us. So you said tongue deviated to the right side in the neurological examination. So what does that well potential finding because you mentioned appeared, so we're gonna call it potential finding. Uh, you know, suggests or demonstrates in terms of potential you know, abnormalities in, in the function of the cranial nerves? Yes, sir. So the tongue deviation to the right side, it's due to a possible or probable uh, damage or compression in the ipsilateral side of the cranial nerve 12. Uh, this is due to uh, being the right side of the uh, cranial nerve uh, being weakened, weakened, the tongue in that side gets weakened and the other side, which is the left one in this case, pushes their tongue to the, to the right side, to the same side of the lesion. Okay, very good, perfect. Let's go ahead then, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so moving on, I'll show you uh, the MRI that it was taken for the patient so you can see the lesion. I don't know if Dr. Bibut is on the line and would like to comment on these images. I have this T1 postgrad sagittal image where you can see here this, uh, where is it? It's right here. This is a extra axial mass that it's enhancing with contrast. As you can see, heterogeneous that is uh, in the posterior fossa compressing the bulbomedullary junction 
uh, extending uh, all the way through C1 level, uh, very close in proximity with the fourth ventricle. The same lesion, you can see it here in a coronal cut, where as we could appreciate in the physical examination, it has a riddle, uh, it, it goes a little bit more to the right, uh, right side of the patient. Same here in the actual cut, you could see the lesion. There is almost no edema surrounding the, 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 the this lesion. You can see here the sagittal T2 flare with no edema, a beautiful plane surrounding the structure, where, which means it's extra axial and just causing some compression and causing this symptomat symptomatology in the patient. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on this. Dr. Patel, uh, would you would you share some comments with us? Yes. Good morning. How are you? Uh, good morning. Good morning, sir. Not the uh, not the original reader of this case, and I don't think I was contacted to review ahead of time. But uh, based on the uh, two sequences that we have here, I mean, uh, you know, we would. I don't know if you have it. Do you have anything else? The T two or the SWI? Um, uh, or no, I don't have those, sir. Okay. Um, yeah, just uh, since it's my first review of the case, it, I would like to see everything. But um, uh, clearly, this thing is going to have to come out because there's a large mass here at the at the uh, foramen magnum compressing the brainstem. It is uh, kind of remarkable given the amount of compression that there's no uh, parenchymal edema, as you mentioned. Um, we have a non-enhancing component, which suggests there might be uh, some necrosis uh, in here. Um, it would be nice to see the T2. Uh, that helps a lot, uh, a bit with the differential here. Um, as far as, uh, you know, just statistically posterior fossa masses like this, you, know, you might anticipate a nerve sheath tumor. Um, I don't see a great uh, drill. Uh, attachment on uh, these slices, but meningioma would be here. Um, sometimes things can sneak back here uh, from uh, osseous structures or from the clivus. So sometimes it, uh, a chordoma can have a very tenuous attachment uh, to the clivus and have a mostly a, a dorsal component like this. Um, there can be primary bone lesions as well, uh, rare things like uh, epithelioid osteoblastomas and things in it, usually in a younger patient. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. And uh, sorry for throwing you under the bus like we've had no, no, that's okay. <laughs> in this last minute <laughs> request opinion. But yeah, when we when we looked at this image uh, in reality, like um, you know, the reality is that uh, I myself I was I was not sure about what type of uh, issue we would be dealing with. And then I think in this case we would have to open uh, you know uh, or possibility of diagnosis of differential diagnosis. I would say. In fact, to me, at least, like when we were looking at the sagittal skin and even the axial, it was difficult to to observe a clear plane of cleavage between the brainstem or the medulla or the posterior surface of the medulla uh, and the mass itself. So at least to me, it was not very clear um, the separation plane between the two of them. Considering that, like in this location, we would have to really think, in my point of view, about all the differential diagnosis of tumors in this area, as you mentioned, some of them. So the age is unlikely, you know, for medulla, but medullos and posterior fossa always included in the differential epidemomas, uh, the, you know, low yield possibility for a, even like a, an exophytic glioma coming from the area, <laughs> although unlikely, uh, you know, in locations like this, one can think about uh, even a giant thrombosed aneurysm, which doesn't look much like that, but within the realm of differentials. And then, as you mentioned, the extraaxial ones like meningiomas uh, uh, as a possibility as well. Um, so maybe uh, the one thing in terms of surgical anatomy, I mean, in terms of potential for, for planning and next steps uh, in this area are always, you know, one, is there a plane of separation with the brain stain in the floor of the four ventricle? Uh, and uh, that's that's always like the big question. So you see that this one here is kind of like in the mostly so inferior to the floor of the four ventricle. And here I, I have a hard time finding the plane of separation, but you know, based on the imagery, there could be one. It's really pushing the tonsils up and uh, it's kind of like opening the space between the two tonsils. Has a pretty large CSF space here near systemic magnus. So that's excellent for surgery because it facilitates the relaxation. And then when we look at the axial, can you show us an axial, JP? Yeah, sure. Let me show you this one. I just want to see the relationship with the vertebral arteries. Would you want me to show you the uh, post guide? Yeah. Here. Yeah. 
Slowly, slowly. Okay. So this is the right vitribro, which is located in front of the tumor. And this is the left vitribro. Okay. And if you scroll up. Go, keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Mm -hmm. And then you see that, uh, I mean, you're going down. Mm -hmm. And then basically you see that the tumor certainly so is posterior to the brain stand, so the vertebrae will be in front of the brain stand. And uh, the branches that will really be important to this is not the vert itself, but the pica branches as they cross around the tonsil. Okay, yes, the caudal loop of the pica. And so, which are not that prominent in this case, but that would be just placed laterally by the tumor. So those are some of the points that we look at when thinking about this tumor. And then of course, since it's difficult to see, one of the other tumors that can happen in this area are hemangioblastomas. And those ones, we got to treat more carefully in terms of surgical strategy and think about where the venous drainage is going from and where it's being supplied for. Uh, so those are some of the points that would be important to consider. Uh, let's go to the next slides, please, JP. Yes, sir. So, as Dr. Almeida said, uh, we consider this differential diagnosis as probable uh, just as METS, glioma, partial thrombogyan aneurysm, meningioma, solitary fibrous tumor, schwannoma, and empenimoma of the fourth ventricle. Uh, for the reason of the possibility of being met, the patient underwent a metastatic workup with a chest, abdomen, and pelvic CTs, where the only relevant finding here was a possible liver and mangioma, nothing to worry about. And next, uh, we try to rule out the possibility of this being a gigant aneurysm. For this reason, the patient underwent a CTA, as you can see here. Uh, the coronal cut in the arterial face of the CTA. Uh, you can see the posterior and anterior circulation with no neurosmatic lesions. I don't know if you want to comment on this, JP. No, I mean uh, basically, I, I, you know, I agree with you, and it is just being extra uh, cautious with with all of this. But uh, I don't see anything that that would be of concern as well. Perfect. So uh, at this point, because of the tumoral origin of the lesion, uh, the patient was decided to go into surgery with a midline suboccipital craniotomy plus C1 posterior arc removal with intra-op neuronavigation and neuromonitoring. The goal of this has surgery was to obtain tissue for diagnosis, obviously, with this maximal safe resection that will help us to relieve the vulvomedullary compression at this point and relieve the patient's symptoms. I'm going to show you now the surgical video. Yeah, so this is, a, you know, just a, a classic approach for lesions around the four ventricles. So it's a midline suboccipital approach. And, um, you know, the opening is very important, such as the closure. You, what you see there is going to be the arch of C1 be mobilized. And then you mobilize that lento occipital membrane to expose the occipitum, the squam of the occipitum. And then uh, there are many ways to do this craniotomy or craniectomy. I particularly like to place tubular holes, one on each side, so you can basically navigate away from the the you know the sinus in the midline. And then you can just go around with your foot plate, as as you see there in the video. After that step is completed. Uh, one can go around uh, for the isolate uh, C1 and remove the most medial aspect of the posterior uh, arch of C1, which allows you then to fully expose the cranial cervical junction. Uh, in terms of that area, the really one thing, unless, I mean, the, the only one thing that you often found is the circular sinus that, uh, you know, will ooze, will bleed, venous bleeding. And you got to be careful when manipulating around the arch of C1 because there can be some bleeding from the vitibral plexus, and therefore you got to be careful with that. Otherwise, it, there is really much, not much. Of course, when you expose C1 laterally, you got to be mindful of the sulcus of the vitibral artery. And uh, in that case, you don't need to go beyond or lateral to that sulcus because you don't need to see the vitibro here, really. Stop the video for a moment. So the opening of the dura here often is done with a Y-shaped opening. So you start from one of the sides, uh, go towards the midline, and then towards the, the upper cervical cord or dura, I'm sorry. 
And then uh, during that time, you often you have some oozing from the circular sinus as you go around the cranial cervical junction. And that is fine. You put stitches, you retract it, that ooze stops. You do the same thing on the left side. And then sometimes you just have to put a bit more stitches there. Once that's done, the door is open. The next step will be to actually open the arachnoid. That in this case where the video is right now is already open, which is fine. We hadn't stopped recording at that point. And then uh, you put some additional stitches as you see here. So those stitches that you see here, they are both retracting the dura, but also the arachnoid. And this initial step is very important as well, because what you want to achieve with your exposure is adequate exposure in the transition between the tumor that is well massive here, the upper cervical spine um, uh, or upper cervical cord, and in the top part that you can kind of see here, which are the tonsils. So you need to have normal and pathological exposure, not only here. The next step will be, as uh, uh, Navajo is going to show now, will be navigating more laterally so you can manipulate and inspect your tumor. So this type of tumor, you see that there is a vein of drainage here and here. And uh, as I told you, I was not sure uh, with Kai, like we were also not sure about what type of tumor this was going to be or to behave. And we had concerns about different types, including, for example, a hemangioblastoma or so. So in this case, unless if necessary, it couldn't move like we would debulk it. But the first step is really not to go inside the tumor and debulk it all and then go. Here is really to find the margins and the separation and to identify the normal anatomy before you go ahead. Uh, and uh, so that's what we started doing here. So what you start to see the next step, or which is gonna be the first step, is gonna be the transaction of the first dentate ligament on the right side, which then is gonna allow us to go ahead and identify the spinal accessory nerve on the right side. And you can identify that in surgery following the anatomy of the nerve, which goes from caudal to cranial interaction to the jugular foramen, but also because even without monitoring, as you dissect near the nerve, you're going to notice the shoulder of the patient moving. So it's kind of like there are small jumps as you get close to that nerve. So you don't even need to put a needle to monitor that nerve in my point of view. So play the video, JP. And there you go. So that's what I'm doing right there. And you see, stop the video for a moment. So here you see a rootlet. This is C1, OK? Go ahead. We're going to do the same thing on the left side to ex achieve that same lateral exposure. And then what we start, what you start to see here, this is spike on the left side and the white uh, nerve uh, next to it is the spinal accessory going towards the jugular from on the left side. As we said, uh, the tonsils are pushed laterally on both sides. And then if we go medial to the tonsils, you'll see once again, the, this is the cranial loop of pica. And then we're working around close to the obex uh, in the top. Uh, you see that with those maneuvers, so just inspecting the tumor around, I was able to mobilize the tumor from attachments on the top, which was basically arachnoid attachments. And here, was what appeared to be the only attachment was really like in this lateral aspect, in the lateral aspect of the Frame Magnum. And then uh, there was one thing to do, like we had to, I decided to monitor that area before transecting that attachment. And before being able to fully separate the tumor, we had the only one nerve that was really attached, which was actually the spinal accessory on the right side. Stop the video right there. Uh, and then the thing uh, to do that separation, we got to notice, we got to understand two things. One is that this, we were able to identify the accessory on its distal aspect towards closer to the jugular foramen. And the second aspect would be to identify it in the proximal trajectory. So we had it in the proximal, we had it distal. And then kind of like we don't see it here. But then what do you do? This is class, this is visible now that this is an extraaxial tumor. So the nerve, should not be infiltrated by this mass, but should be pushed by this mass. And this nerve usually does this thing here. This is how it, it does how it goes. So this nerve should not be here. It should not be here. It should not be here. This nerve is has to go here because this is the anatomy and the anatomy kind of like rarely will change. And then to remove that, you see that what we decide to do right now is to get a curved tip scissor. So the scissor goes up rather than be straight and mobilize, retract with a suction, the tumor, find this small arachnoid plane and literally kind of like go exactly there. So uh, go ahead, JP. 
So with this maneuver, uh, we can preserve the accessory nerve, mobilize it away from the tumor, and achieve basically a separation of the tumor. So we remove the attachment, we disconnect the neurovascular structures that were surrounded and pushed by the tumor. And now, after that is all done, it's a matter of inspection and slowly mobilizing, and you see here, cauterizing the wall of the mass, so to mobilize it away from the dorsal surface of the medulla and upper cervical spine. But at this time, that right there, the tumor is free. There is no more connections. And then uh, we can, you know, just go ahead and, and do the Hollywood maneuver now. And then here it comes. And then, yeah, yeah, it came out. And then uh, basically we got to see this nice anatomy. Stop the video again, please. So uh, this nice anatomy where we can see here the tonsils. This is the left tonsil. This is the right tonsil. This here uh, is going to be the biventral lobule in here as well. And then here we're going to have this space is going to be the most caudal aspect of the floor of the four ventricle. And then you have here the medulla and the upper cervical spine that were compressed. You can see that there is even a downslope. This is the spinal accessory on the right side. This is pica on the left and the spinal accessory coming this way. This is some residual dentate ligament on the left. So with, uh, you know, with this anatomy and with some of the maneuvers that we, the maneuvers that we showed here, we were uh, blessed to be able to fully remove this tumor and block. So there is no tumor left there. Play the video now. And then really it's a matter of, um, you know, hemostasis, making sure everything looks good. And then the dural closure is very, very important in cases like this. If the dura is fine, it can close primarily. If not, you can use a dura subicitate. And then after that, the next very, very important aspect is the closure of the muscle layers. So the muscle layers are really the ones that will save you from, a, you know, pseudomeningocele and any other issue like that. So that's why, like in the opening, I particularly like to open in a Y-shaped fashion as well. So separating the muscles that we will attach to the spironuchal line leaving a small V-shaped cuff that then uh, it goes midline and then you kind of suture all the muscles back so that the muscles, at least all the muscles, will close again as a book. So as you open the book, you close the book again at the end. And, um, and that's it. Perfect. Thank you so much, JP, for all those comments. Beautiful surgery. And uh, now at this point, uh, after surgery, uh, due to a some delay awakening after the anesthesia, the patient underwent a CT. I don't know if Dr. V. Wood is on the line. I would like to comment on this. This is just a CT to make sure that the patient was with no bleeding or anything that was causing that delay awakening. Everything was normal and the patient uh, awoke uh, right away after that. Here you can see the post-op MRI where uh, you can see in the sagittal T1 without contrast uh, that there is no lesion, no residuals, beautiful resection of the tumor, releasing all that bulbo medullary, medullary compression at this point. Here is the same cut in a T1 post -gut. And again, there is no residuals here uh, that we can observe at this point. This is, again, the axial and coronal cuts of the same uh, post-op period of the patient where we see no lesion. Moving on, uh, Dr. Gentov, I don't know if you're on the line and would like to comment on the pathology of this patient. Yes. Thanks so um, much, sir. So this is a very low power view um, of this case. And it's a basically a cross section of specimen. And just like JP was showing in the video, it's a very well demarcated tumor, um, has a rounded um, pushing border. Um, when you, you look at this, you have areas that are a little bit more cellular that are blue. And ones that are a little bit more fibrous that are, are pink. And there were a few areas that had a little bit of degenerative uh, change uh, within it as well. But if you go to higher power now. Next slide. You'll see that it is a uh, spindle cell neoplasm um, and that there is quite a abundant uh, collagen. If you can go back one slide. 
Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, I... Sorry. Can, oh, oh, can you go back? There you go. Um, if you see this to the middle slide. This one? The next one there, right there. Um, I think there must be a delay or something. Okay. So I'll go to, go the, to the, fir the first one. There, that, this, um, if you see, there is a spindle cell neoplasm here with abundant collagen, and that's that pink stuff in the middle. If you look at the insert on the right-hand side, lower right-hand corner, and that was the middle slide. Yeah, I think they're seeing that one now, sir. There must be a delay on my end. I'm, I'm sorry. So we are in the middle one right now, the high power okay. one. The lower right hand corner is a higher power insert. It shows mitotic activity. This tumor did have mitotic activity, but it did not reach five mitoses per 10 high power field to put it into an intermediate grade. Um, so this would be a grade one uh, solitary fibrous tumor. Now to prove it's solitary fibrous tumor, if we go to the immunohistochemical stains for EMA and STAT6. Yes, sir, we are there. Oh, I don't see it on my screen. Um, but anyway, the tumor is negative for EMA and it was positive for STAT6. Um, so that proves in this sort of setting that it is uh, indeed a solitary fibrous tumor and not a meningioma. Perfect, thank you so much, sir, thank you. So as Dr. Gentoff uh, pointed out, this is a solitary fibrous tumor, CNS, WHO grade one. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Gentoff. Uh, well, in post-op day one, the patient was neurologically intact. Uh, the only thing that he still presented was mild numbness in left fingertips, but the pain in the left neck, shoulder, and arm was completely resolved by then. In post-op day two, the patient was discharged home with a dexamethasone tapper for seven days, but completely neurologically intact. And just a matter of the review, uh, well, solitary fibrous tumors uh, comprehend or are uh, represent 1.9 to 4.6 percent of intracranial tumors uh, with the mean age of presentation being uh, in between 38 to 48 45 years old they are more common in men and grade three have high risk of recurrence of approximately 50 percent within five years and uh, this is something interesting or curious about these uh, tumors, which uh, before 2016, solitary fibrous tumors and hemangiopery cytomas were thought to represent distinct entities. And uh, nevertheless, the WHO in 2016 classification united two terms into one hybrid called SFT uh, slash hemangiopery cytoma, referring to a group of mesenchymal non mendongothelial neoplasms with a NAP2 STAT6 mutation, as Mark, uh, Dr. Gentoff uh, comment on, on the previous slides. Uh, in 2021, the WHO CNS had two more classification, deleted completely the term hemangiopericytoma, and now we just call them solitary fibrous tumors, and we classify them in the three grades, as explained by Dr. Gentoff. And well, this review published in 2020 analyzed 368 patients uh, included in 29 studies where they compared the epidemiological characteristics of intracranial versus spinal solitary fibrous tumors. And the only thing that I will uh, say about this review uh, for the matter of time is that the recurrence time is shorter for spinal versus intracranial tumors uh, of six versus eight years on average, respectively. And I think that's it. Thank you so much for, for your time. Uh, great, uh, Navajinho. And I mean, I call, I call this guy Navajinho because he is trying to steal my name. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to fight for my name, but uh, I mean, it's, if there is another JP, it better be you because you're pretty good. So thank you for your work. Uh, I have a I'm question sure. actually for uh, uh, Dave Abarbanel. Dave, you here? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, man. Good to see you. Good morning, Dave. Uh, so I was thinking about this case. So, you know, uh, very nice resection as you saw patients doing clinically very well. And um, yeah. and, uh, you know, fiber solitary uh, grade one. And so uh, would you would you do additional assessment for this case? Um, in this case, I, I would do 
some systemic staging. I, I would probably just image the entire neuraxis. You know how much I love my uh, MRI, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, <laughs> and get a CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Um, okay. Just to, just to see what we see. I'd be happy to see the patient. I don't. Is he going? Is he scheduled to see me? But I don't know. But I'm going to ask um, uh, uh, Navajo to help us with that. Would you would you check uh, please and uh, and let let us know? Uh, you can email Dr. Barbano and myself, JP. Did you hear me, JP? No, sorry, sir. I was saying that uh, uh, Dr. Barbanel, uh, you know, w is willing to see the patient help us with the care as well. Yeah. And absolutely. it's interesting. So would you please check to see if he, the patient has been scheduled already? And if it not, you can email myself, Dr. Chai Chen and Dr. Barbanel so we can have that referral put in place. Definitely, I'll do. Thank you, appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. And it's interesting for us, kind of like to, kind of like to see that as well, because uh, you know the the behavior and the, the different classifications and our understanding how it goes, it is it is very different. And in terms of cases, I mean, uh, I have to say, I mean, uh, for our colleagues here, it was very interesting to see this one as a you know a fiber solitary tumor, but with that you know kind of like single place of attachment uh, as you guys saw there. I was, I was, I have to say, I was a bit surprised at this, but I don't know. Uh, maybe if anybody else has a has more experience, uh, Dr. Vargas, uh, you know, any other team members here, it would be interesting to hear because I was, <laughs> I was a bit surprised with that, you know, just that attachment. But I don't know. Maybe sometimes we're lucky. Dr. Vargas. Yeah, the, it's is not common that uh, we have that kind of. Uh lucky situation that only with uh, some uh, disattachment uh, the the tumor uh, comes like that uh, and uh, congratulations for the tumor and i wrote uh, talking about the symptoms because it's surprised that this big tumor pushing the the brain stem and things like that and uh, and i think that you said at the beginning headache I imagine that was something with the hydrocephalus or something like that. There was nothing uh, on the physical examination, nothing at gate and things like that. So uh, surprise uh, for for these tumors. And at the beginning uh, was something on the shoulder, not an arm pain or something like that. And maybe it was, I cannot explain exactly this kind of symptoms, but this is important to say to the students and the people that this is is good to to really do a, a good uh, uh, symptoms uh, of findings and uh, history and examination in order to really uh, see the, the patient and congratulations for this the case rare uh, um, histological diagnosis is not common this kind of, of tumors so lucky, yeah. lucky, and a good case. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for the comments, uh, Gabriel. So I think we have another very interesting case as well. So for the sake of time, so we have enough discussion. Maybe we move to the next case as well. 